Greetings, everyone. My name is Jack Kay. I'm the creator of Wellness in Color and the author of the recently released ebook, Eating in Color. And right now, you are joining Recharge for Folks Exhausted by Racial Trauma. Before we begin, I'm going to read the names of people taken from police brutality and medical racism, and we will have a moment of silence for them and for people whose name I do not know yet. This moment is for Brianna Taylor, Shaija Washington, Andres Guardado, Ahmad Aubrey, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, George Floyd, and Elijah McCain. Thank you. So today we have with us Asha Frost. Asha Frost is an indigenous Ojibwe, did I say that correct? Ojibwe. Ojibwe, medicine healer and founder of Sacred Membership, a global online medicine circle community. She has served thousands of people for the past two decades in her work as a native healer, homeopath, teacher, and leader and has studied with many shamans, medicine people, elders, and guides. Impacted by generational trauma, colonization, and oppression, Asha has committed to a journey to reclaim and remember her roots and medicine teachings. She has specialized in helping people heal through illness, mental and emotional disorders, and ancestral disconnection. Through this work, she has loved seeing people find their own healing wisdom, awaken their roots, and rise into their power. She is currently working on a book titled You Are the Medicine, which will be published by Hay House and released in 2020, 2022. If you would like to connect with Asha or book some of her services, head to ashafrost.com or her Instagram, asha.frost. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement I am on Muskogee Creek, also known as Georgia. Mm. Thank you. And I'm on Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Huron Wendat land, also known as Newmarket, Ontario, Canada. So, Asha, I'm so grateful to have you here with me today. Thank you and for having me. Of course. Um, and I would love for you to. Um, welcome us and begin us with a um, smudging ceremony. Amazing. So as you were reading those names, I could already feel um, the healing starting, the healing starting, our hearts opening. So, you know, when we burn smudge and we, we use the ceremony, it does translate across the, the internet and the medicine goes far. So before we start, I just encourage you or invite you to place your feet on the floor and to feel Mother Earth beneath your feet and to feel yourself connected to the earth and all things. Those names that you read out, we are interconnected with their essences and their spirits and the harm that has happened. So we're just gonna use this medicine to clear and purify and help us to heal from all of it. As you root your feet into the earth, we have cedar burning, sage burning, sweetgrass burning, and a little bit of tobacco in this sage and smudge ceremony. I'm going to use my eagle feather today, and I invite you to close your eyes. May this medicine cleanse our connection to the spirit world. As we invite in the ancestors, no commis ni shomis, to all the grandmothers and grandfathers that came before us, we ask that you surround us with protection, with healing and with the wisdom that you have carried through lifetimes. We welcome you, miigwech, miigwech. And as the beautiful smudge burns through and around your energy body, we weave the smoke across our eyes. May we see with kindness and truth. We weave the smoke around our ears. May we heal from anything that has harmed us that we've taken in. We weave this into our throat center. May we speak the truth that is in our hearts and in our souls. We move the smudge down to our hearts and today we receive. May we open our hearts and our minds to all of the information, the wisdom that will be shared through this series. We move this sacred medicine down to our bellies. 
May we be connected to our power, connected to our inner healer, connected to the wisdom that flows through us effortlessly. And I move the smoke down our legs to the soles of our feet, reconnecting us to that earth mother, feeling held and supported, feeling loved and nourished. May this medicine surround your energy and your body and your mind. May it bring you everything that you are needing right now. And may it release all that is no longer serving you. And so it is. And the way that we say thank you in Ojibwe is miigwech, miigwech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asha. I definitely feel um, less heavy um, and open now. So thank you. Welcome. I would love if you could um, tell people that are not familiar with sage and everything else that you were burning, um, what is smudging and how does it fit within the context of liberation and or healing from racial inflicted violence? Mm. So smudging is actually a term that's used by indigenous folks um, across North America, not all First Nations. I know there's the word tribe in the States, we use the word First Nation more in Canada. Not all First Nations actually smudge, but it is a practice that has been with us for forever. And it's something that we use to cleanse and purify ourselves. It's something that we use in all of our ceremonies. And it's something that helps us, in my belief, to reconnect to who we truly are. And as you saw, I, I asked our ancestors to be here. So as soon as I light a smudge, I feel like those who have come before us are surrounding us. Um, and it's a way for some to pray. And whether you believe in prayer or not, it is a way to connect us to all that is. And I believe when we light sacred medicine or we do a smudge for healing, for helping us to feel free, to, to help us to kind of unlock from the trauma, I think the actual medicine helps to purify our hearts. I believe that when we light this, we are honoring the sacredness within ourselves. I believe that the medicine helps us to root back to that divine essence that we are and cleanses away the parts that are not us, that are not of us and the parts that have harmed us or hurt us mm -hmm. because it is a really beautiful medicine to cleanse away that trauma and to purify us. So I really believe it. You know, every time I light a smudge, I always tear up. I always feel like I'm going to cry, especially if it's with family. So I believe it's that remembering that activates that um, we are all interconnected and we, yeah, it just brings that teaching back to us. So that's, that's what it does for me. Thank you. Um, I actually shed a tear too. So I, honestly, um, when I close my eyes, so thank you. Um, you know, I've learned from you as well that intentions are very important when smudging, right? And you actually set the intentions when you um, let us in smudging. So could you explain to the audience um, what are intentions? What do they mean? Um, and what does it look like when we smudge our places? Yes. Our places? I believe that intention is important when we're doing smudging um, because it honors the tradition of where you're taking that from or where you're borrowing it from. I think that um, keeping that like a sacred ceremony is really important because we have probably seen, I'm sure folks have seen different examples of ways that sage has been used in not a sacred way. So I think that intention brings us back to that. This is a sacred medicine. It's been taken from, you know, people who have been oppressed and colonized and really truthfully, um, some of those ceremonies have been stripped away from us. So intention just brings that back to, I believe it's important to set the intention honoring the ancestors. Um, an intention is sort of like a, a calling or words that really feel aligned with you. So I believe intentions should feel like they're coming from your heart. They're coming from um, your soul place, you know, and not just words that you're kind of just borrowing from, from another place. So intentions to me is like, can you be really personal? And I believe that um, an intention for what you want to see for your healing. I always like to talk about a healed vision. What is your healed vision? And how do you envision that? Or how do you feel yourself um, living that out? I think that that is an important part of the intention because being the visionary, I think, for a healed world is probably where many of us are trying to go. Yes. Yes, I can agree with that. 
And you, you spoke a little bit about how the, the ceremony was stripped um, from some indigenous folks. And I would love if you could um, speak about either so a little bit of the history of that um, and why, right, and how we can then smudge in a way that is respectful and not um, cultural appropriating, right? Like we, it's important for us to recognize, like you said, this is medicine um, of an, uh, oppressed people. And we, even as people of color, right, that is not our right to then take that. So if you could speak a little bit about that. Yes. So I believe, and I can only speak for this one Indigenous voice, because I know many Indigenous people actually feel that nobody should be smudging, but I, because it's such a sacred medicine, and I believe it can help so many of us, I believe that there's a way to do this that's in your integrity. And only you will know. I always like to say it's between you and your creator, you mm -hmm. and whoever you believe in that you're connected to. Only you'll, you'll only know about your connection to that, but know the history, know the history of the Indigenous people in your in your country where you live, know your land acknowledgements. I think that's a beautiful thing before you smudge, maybe acknowledge the land of those first peoples that were there. Um, and also know, you know, I think the history is so important of residential schools, the, the aspects I was speaking about, about, um, you know, these were banned for us. So even for somebody like me, it's been a really huge road and a, a lot of trauma to uncover and heal through just to even feel worthy of smudging myself. So mm -hmm. I think just holding the whole picture of what's going on in Canada, we have um, a lot of trauma from the residential schools. We have First Nations without clean water to drink. We have really high suicide rates on our First Nations with youth. So knowing about those issues, I think are really important. And I'm not saying you need to learn about it overnight, but I think holding the whole picture and not just taking it as this pretty thing that we're going to do and post on Instagram is really important. So that's, that's what's important for me. Thank you so much, Asha. Um, and I hope that we can all, um, we're all learning from this and from you. So thank you so much. I thank really so much. appreciate this. Thank you. So now that we have censored ourselves in our headspace for today's panel, the rest of the event will focus on the different ways in which radical self-care and activism coexist. How these things, these two things are critical in order to sustain our movement toward collective liberation. And then we will speak about ancient healing techniques and experience one, a sound bath. I'll begin by reading each person's bio and then ask them a few questions. Bria, I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, Bria is a millennial racial and gender justice activist working locally and nationally towards the liberation of all oppressed people with an emphasis on black people and women. She has contributed to dozens of electoral and advocacy campaigns, including the 2017 Women's March, where she served as the youngest national organizer. The campaigns to free Meek Mill, the 2018 student walkouts against gun violence, and much more. Bria connects influencers and industry leaders to activism in authentic, meaningful, and sustainable ways. Working across fields from activism to the entertainment industry to politics, she believes in the need for progressive policy along with a culture that reflects and affirms everyone's right to thrive. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking about this and it's so important now more than ever. I agree, I agree. So I'd love for you to tell us, when you return home from an action, do you take time to recharge and recense yourself? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I definitely need to recharge and recenter after an action. Sometimes that happens at the action, depending on who the organizers are and how intentional they are. But the deeper that I've gotten into my organizing, the more I seek to build that into the program so that people don't leave emotionally vulnerable and open and sort of susceptible to whatever comes from that, right? Like if that's rage, if that's sadness, um, and then sort of going back to a space that you might not have 
um, the, the quiet or the community that you need to recharge. Um, but whether the space brings that or not, I definitely have to do that. Cause I found like the more that I organize, I would find myself crying at protests. I would find myself like leaving and not being able to eat consistently or like my sleeping patterns were off. And I was just like, Ooh, I could, I could feel a physical and emotional shift in myself when I'm stressed, when I'm too plugged in. So a lot of times my recharging looks like unplugging from social media and from like the constant um, oversensitization, oversensitizing of us, you know, and just like we're just so used to seeing these traumatic videos going viral, et cetera. So that's one huge way. Um, but there are different ways to look for everyone, you know, for everyone. Some people that's being in nature, some people that's getting a good home cooked meal, mm -hmm. some people that's physical touch and hugs. Um, but I just have to engage in some sort of activity that allows me to decompress and, and even just like debrief, like what I'm experiencing in it. Um, because it's so easy for us to go through the motions and feel like it's normalized um, and it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. So I'm glad that that is something that you um, are cognizant of and doing what you need to to recharge and to also provide that for other people, right? Because yeah. you're going home at night, um, but like you said, there are other folks as well that need that space and that support. One million percent. Um, so has there been one factor or multiple um, factors in your life that has prominently shaped your understanding and practice of self-preservation? Mm. Um, I think it's more so been this compounding of factors, you know, like I think when I first got started in activism, it was right after Trayvon Martin was killed. And I was 17 also at the time. So as a young person who was experiencing that happened to another young person, um, that was what sort of catalyzed me. Um, but I think it was more so the like daily unlearnings and relearnings of me just looking around my community and being like, oh, wait, that exists all around me and I've just been so numb to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think all of that sort of reminded me that like, especially, I mean, every generation has their own traumas that they deal with, but I think it's just compounded by social media and the technological age that we're in right now that we really cannot escape um, the pain and the trauma of being black in America, um, especially when you're also a woman or femme, especially when you're also queer or tra like, so, um, so I think self-care became really radical in the sense that I began to realize that also another part of white supremacy was wanting me to be too tired all the time, too exhausted all the time. And so it was like, so if I'm winning, you know, in my campaigns, but then I'm coming home exhausted and I'm overworked and I don't have good relationships, et cetera, then like, that's not freedom. And I began to think critically about like what what freedom actually looks like for me. And that also, like I said, it, it changed the way that I organized. When I first got started, I was like sharing police brutality videos left and right. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, unless a victim of police brutality explicitly asks me for their support in that way, I don't do that anymore because it's like, I don't want to further traumatize and trigger my community mm -hmm. in the process of advocating, right? And like that how we get there is just as important as like what happens when we get there. Um, so it's definitely, I wouldn't say that it's one specific event, but I think it's just like the more that I have become intentional and some of that is just like listening to my elders who were like, girl, this is a marathon, you know, you have to be able to take care of yourself. And I'd rather have you here for the long haul than you getting burnt out and not coming back to movement spaces again. So. Mm. Mm. Wow. And so on the topic of elders, yeah. I would love to know, right, um, when you think about your ancestors and the people that are either here or no longer here mm -hmm. um, physically with you, right, how do you honor them both in your work and in your self-care? Yeah, I mean, I um, have been honoring my more immediate elders and ancestors more explicitly as I've been losing people. So last year I lost my grandfather, and that was like the first time that I was like, I want to build an altar. I want to honor him and not go through life pretending like he didn't have this huge impact for me, especially for my activism as like a black man who, who made it his business to own land in the South and like what it, you know, just like I get so much fire from him. And so I wanted to make sure that I could stay connected. But even before that, I've, I've always used that language to refer to freedom fighters past, right? And I think that it's so important you know, I think we're often talking about youth being the present and the future. 
Um, but like eventually youth organizers grow up to be adult allies, right? And like, we can't always be stuck in the youth age. And so as I thought about like, what kind of elder do I be, do I want to be? I also began to think of like, well, dang, what kind of youth organizer do I want to be? And how do I want to be in community with elders? So it changed my relationship to just like honoring that wisdom and recognizing like, you don't have to learn things the hard way. And like, whoever told you that you did, did not have those ancestors in their lives, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I'm so sorry for your loss, um, but I'm, I'm glad that he is here with you in another way, you know? Yeah, yes, definitely. Thank you so much, sis. So, Natasha. Um, Natasha's next. Natasha is a tarot and oracle card reader, a medium, a healing arts and candle work practitioner, Reiki and Lahochi certified practitioner. Her pronouns are she, her, they, and them. Natasha identifies as a black, queer, gender questioning femme, divine feminine twin flame, and a black mermaid princess. She is here to do this work to aid in your liberation, healing, and our ultimate pleasure. Spirit doesn't want us to be in pain and unhappy, and Natasha uses their craft to help facilitate and assist in your healing process. Natasha has been reading cards and channeling ancestors since she was 15 years old in high school. Becoming the twerk tarot priestess has been a beautiful journey and evolution. They love twerk and utilize it as a means of POC femme queer liberation. That is also how they see and utilize their gifts. Natasha, thank you so much for being here with us today. So what I want to talk about today, right? I want to acknowledge that some people might not see our cards and readings as something that people of color, specifically black folks do. Um, and we might have some unlearning to do in that area. So I'm curious, how do you use your practice to affirm your blackness and honor your ancestors? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for having me today. This is so much fun. Um, so my all of my practices help to affirm all of the parts of myself right so and in my blackness understanding that growing up i grew up in like as a you know easter sunday mother's day maybe christmas kind of baptist right <laughs> um and then when i grew up and had my own children so i'm a mother of two we um, joined the AME church, the African Methodist church, um, and really loved being in that environment, being in that community. But also knowing that I love me some Jesus, but it wasn't enough, right? It wasn't the full spectrum of how I, how my body, how my spirit recognized the world, right? And so as I, and growing up, like, you know, being in church, sunrise service on Easter, but also having my friends who are Puerto Rican and learn, teenagers and learning about Santeria, right? And learning about the Arishas. And then also being like super in love with um, Greek and Egyptian and Roman mythology, right? Mm -hmm. And then being able to see, oh, all of these things layer on top of each other. We call things mythology when we no longer want to give them the respect that they are right like we we call you know we we want to um move them away from their deity states and just be like those are stories um and then being an old even older and understanding um just um, um indigenous traditions right uh, of the earth and realizing that they all fall and layer and marry, especially when you add the African diaspora, right, on top of it. So, so just like a little bit of a, you know, Lam time thing, right? So you have Ifa, right, that is a West African, um, which is an African tradition um, that really uh, um, honors the earth, the elements, and has a myriad of Orishas, um, which... For us, we will probably call deities or gods, goddesses, right? And then we are moved from, we are stolen, we are taken across the Caribbean, Latin America, and the Americas, right? And what you see is that that tradition does not die, 
that tradition evolves, right? That tradition evolves into Santeria. That tradition gets married with indigenous practice. That tradition gets married with Catholicism, right? We see how, how our ancestors uses the tools of the oppressor, which is the Catholic church, to hide their indigenous practice um, and to keep it alive. And so for me, when I'm in my practice, when I, um, so when I say I am a Black mermaid princess, I do that from this deep love and admiration for Yeme Yats, right? Who I believe is has been and always ha will be with me. Like, and I am a physical embodiment of some of her spirit. But also knowing that Yeme Ya is also an embodiment of Mama Wata, which is the original um, mermaid goddess, who is also seen as, in some, as Venus, as Aphrodite, who all gets layered and and like married together because ultimately she's the she's the goddess of the ocean and all the things that we believe happens in the ocean and of our womb. And so I get to like be in that space with Yemeya and love on her and know that then she is connected to to Oshun, who everybody now knows because of Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Everybody's rocking a golden yellow. Yeah, you put it on. <laughs> Right? And so it all marries together. So I get to practice my Blackness. I get to practice the diaspora. I get to practice and be in deep connection to my in Indigenous roots and into my current roots of the Black Baptist and um, African Methodist tradition. Because I, listen, put on, put on some Kurt Franklin right now. Put on. <laughs> Do you want a revolution? You, like, we can do it. Like you put on, put on, put on something and watch me cry like a baby. Put, <laughs> put on just every mountain, right? Like I'm gonna do it because I can have it all, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one of the ways in which that like ties into a tarot tradition is like there's this card that I'm now look for called the Seven of Cups. And sometimes that, ca that card is read as, you have too many choices, too many decisions. But I now read that card as, I have all the choices. I have all the decisions. I have the myriad of the world in front of me, ahead of me. And I can, all roads are open, all things. I have it all, right? Why, why choose? Didn't, didn't, didn't Cardi tell us not to choose? to take it all. Didn't she tell us that? She warned yeah. us. So you can have Jesus. You can have God. You can have Gaia. You can have Yemega. You can have it all and borrow and mix, but don't appropriate. It's different. Right. Respect. Respect. Right? <laughs> and learn and kind of try some stuff on learn from some folks, read some good books, mm -hmm. and then, you know, develop a practice that feels good in your body. I like that. I like that. I actually just learned some stuff. So, but while we are, you know, on the topic of doing what feels good for your body, right? Because this is about what makes us feel good. And at the same time, recognizing that the work that makes, not, I don't want to call it the work, but the practices that make us feel good also make our community feel good, right? And like self-care is not selfish because as Audre Lorde said, this is self-preservation. And so I'd love to know, right? Like Natasha, when you, you talked about all that, how does that fit into your, um, your nine to five work, I guess to say, as well as um, how you see um, contributing to the collective black liberation? Like what is that, how does this play into that? Yeah, and I think part of it is that not all self-care feels good. Mm. Like therapy is self-care, therapy don't always feel good. Like, <laughs> it's for your best good, mm. always, right? Like some of our self-care isn't actually to feel good in the moment, mm -hmm. but to feel good over our life. And it's like working out. I don't always like having to get down on that yoga to feel better afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. But 
and like nine to five where I um, am the director of the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice, where we organize in Black, Latinx, um, Indigenous, low-income communities around education, equity, and justice, and holding responsive education. Um, it really, one, it helps to sustain, sustain me, right? Being able to come home to my altar, lay, lay it on the altar. And this is once again, like, where we think there's a dichotomy between the church or religion and spirituality and an altar, right? Like if I went into um, a church and I, I could, I will still lay bare on the altar. Like you walk up to the front of the church, you lay it bare. The difference is, is that my altar is right here, right? It's right is right where I can have access to it all the time and I could come home and lay it on my altar and and know that I will be given something, <laughs> some kind of answer. Um, so like it helps to sustain me. It helps to keep bringing me back into the work. It helps to continue. Because look, education just got cut a billion dollars in New York City. I need something to bring me back other than vodka. Like, like you can't just... And so for me, having these practices, being able to do medicine making, being able to put my hands on herbs, um, being able to put my, my whatever we want to call them, wishes, manifestations, prayers, just but put my heart's needs and concerns on a candle and burn it is what actually keeps me in the work because it keeps me connected to the thing that is above me right? Like, we think about, you know, I had this beef with some of the, like, the white healers, right? And it's because, um, like, it's like, we're raising a vibration of humanity. And so, and it's like, okay, but you're not going to talk about systemic racism, because that's low vibrational. And I was like, but if there is, there is nothing more like, if we do nothing else on this earth, then get people free, then what, what is the most high, that has to be the most high vibrational last thing I will ever do in my life, is to help get people free, help get me free, help get my children free, um, to be the biggest, brashest, boldest parts of ourselves, right? That is the work. That should be the work of humanity, right? To see each other and to be free with each other. It's how I stay in the work and staying connected to my ancestors and knowing that healing that we do for ourselves in the moment goes back um, both seven generations, right? So like thinking that I get to help heal generational trauma going back seven generations, going back to somebody who was taken and on a slave ship, right? The work I do now, that feels really uncomfortable a lot of times, but also that it goes seven generations forward, right? To great, 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 great grandchildren whose names I may never even know, right? That is powerful work. And that is both work of like the organizing of how do we get free right here, right now on this plane in this 3D, but also how do we leave something better from when we not even here no more? Oh man, you're making me tear up. Thank you. Um, oh my, I wasn't expecting to do that, but I just can't help but think about, you know, when you speak about healing generations forward and backward, like my own child and how I, and both of you spoke about this, right? But like how I'm currently cultivating practices that did not, that weren't encouraged, I would say, right? And now that I'll have something to give her, like we actively do this together, you know? Like I start smudging and this is what she does, I promise you not, she starts doing this. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and, she's, and she's only about to be two. So I have a, a great time ahead of me, but it, it is it's yes. powerful. But, but it's also about all the things that you won't give her, right? Like you won't, so when I think about how much work so as a fat black person how much work i've had to do to decolonize my own thinking about my own body right and so because i don't want my children to then have those same things that they carry about their bodies regardless of how they look 
right? And so if I can heal that in myself, I won't even give it to them. It won't even be a thing that they have to heal because they would have never had it. It's like, it's like chicken pox inoculations. Kids nowadays don't get the chicken pox. My generation, my, like I remember not going to school for two weeks because I had the chicken pox. My kids and their friends have never had the chicken pox. Right? So like think about all of the things that when we do healing work that we don't even give our children, don't, that are eradicated in real time with our own bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Is everyone feeling good or prepared? I'm feeling great. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Great. That was beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer, we're on to you. Hi. Hello. Okay. So Jennifer is a Latina soulpreneur. Since 1998, she has been helping other Latina and women of color community leaders, empaths, creatives, and service professionals to live meaningful and balanced lives. She offers a variety of services for people looking to reduce stress, increase self-confidence, trust their innate abilities, and break generational cycles of trauma and drama. If you're interested in honing your skills as an energy healer, Jennifer also offers healing training and certification. Jennifer, thank you so much um, for being here with us today. You are appreciated and what you're about to offer us, we are excited to receive. Oh, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So some of the audience might not be um, might be familiar with your work and sound healing, especially since you so graciously allowed me to feature you in my ebook, Eating in Color. Um, but for those of you that are, for those folks that are new um, and do not know much about you and sound healing, I would love if you could tell us what is sound healing um, and what is a sound bath? Sound healing is using sound with intentions to heal. So sound could be any instrument such as these crystal bowls. It could be your voice. It could be a rattle, you know, drumming, you know, um, just anything that you want to create a, a beautiful sound that has some vibrational healing to it or some vibrational um, intentions can help someone to bring about a healing experience. Sound healing, you can really incorporate a variety of different uh, sounds that will help you to heal uh, an emotional part, uh, a psychological, a physical, a cellular level, the ancestral or generational traumas, our DNA that we're born with, that we come from mother. And so using sound healing, specifically if you're wanting to heal generational or um, uh, ancestral wounds, incorporating sound healing can really begin to shift your energy as well as because we're mostly bodies of water using sound helps to recalibrate uh, and it can reshape our body of water, our earth body, and we can experience uh, a deeper release of letting go. So um, as Natasha talked about, like doing the work, like is our self care, it isn't always pretty. So when we incorporate sound healing, sometimes that darker, shadowy, heavier trauma that we experience when we're releasing, when we're healing, sound healing can also bring about a gentle, compassionate, uh, loving experience for someone who is truly going into their shadows, who really is trying to break generational traumas mm -hmm. and just even for like the the topic today you know those folks who are so exhausted and so overwhelmed exactly we have to make sure that we rise above that so that we aren't emotionally mentally exhausted so using sound can help to shift and raise the vibration in order to sustain the the momentum 
and the fight to continue for justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I think it's important for folks to understand, especially like you said, it could essentially be any instrument, right? So I'm assuming that is um, in your practice, right? You use instruments that um, I don't want to speak to you, but that um, you're comfortable with, right? Would that be a correct thing to say? Yeah, you know, I use a native drum. I use the bowls. I have a... Um, a crystal, whoa, a crystal singing pyramid here that I'll be using. Um, and wind chimes. So just anything that helps to activate also a memory or just the space to release and let go, a space to go into that meditative trance um, in order to help you to find forgiveness and find um, endurance to, to keep going. Okay. It's the medicine of sound just as we would um, with smudging or with food or herbs, you know, some natural uh, way sound is also that medicine for us to keep uh, moving forward. Thank you. And I think, you know, I think about even my music choice, Right. And like how that fits into what make what speaks to me at a cellular level. Um, but also, like we said, um, brings up certain memories that make me feel good or sometimes feel sad. Um, so thank you. Whenever you're ready, um, I would really appreciate it if you could lead us into the sound bath. Um, I guess for folks that are listening, um, it's best if you have headphones on and you are in a more relaxed state, if that is possible. And Jennifer, if you'd like to add anything else, feel free to do so. Yeah. So when I start playing, if you have any smudging or if you have incense or a candle, your crystals, if you want to bring those out and surround yourself um, and creating a sacred space, creating uh, a protective energy, because also with working with sound, specifically the tools that I'm going to be using today, the instruments I'll be using, sometimes people are going to come in and out. They might experience like they're elevating out of body experience. They might go into a dreamlike state. They may also connect with their guides and their ancestors. So, or they may have emotional releases. So know that anything that you experience with this sound bath uh, is all to serve your highest and greatest good.
and slowly begin to bring yourself back into your physical body, into this physical plane, and just notice what's available here for you. If you made any connections with your higher self, your intuitive self, your ancestors and guides, thanking them, being in a space of gratitude, knowing that you deserve this. And you can take this energy, this vibration with you for as long as you want, for as long as you need it. And continuing to help to raise your awareness, raise your consciousness, to be of peace, to be of love, to be of one. And so be it. Slowly begin to bring movement back into your body, wiggling your toes, your hands, stretching if that feels good. Eventually open your eyes, adjusting to the lighting in the room, feeling more alert, awake and aware. And welcome back. Thank you. Yeah.